in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We'll continue tonight our reflections on Psalm 109. This psalm actually is called by the people a psalm of curse. And many people actually is a question how David, the man of the very kind heart, stand before God and curse his enemies in this way. But as St. John Chrysostom and as St. Augustine and St. Jerome explained, this psalm actually is a prophecy about the Messiah. So David was not cursing an enemy, but David actually uttered by the Holy Spirit the curse that will happen on the nation of the Jews whom they did not repent after they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and on the person also of Judas Iscariot. And St. Peter in the book of Acts chapter 1 confirmed this when he said the Holy Spirit is spoke by David the prophet concerning Judas. So at least in this statement that we read it in Acts chapter 1, St. Peter before quoting Psalm 109, he said it is written by the Holy Spirit. On the mouth of David, about or concerning Judas. So this psalm is just a prophecy. What will happen? Not David actually is cursing his enemies. From verse 6 to verse 15, David explained what is the curse that will happen on Judas or on the nation of the Jews. Then starting from verse 16, he is explaining to verse 20 that this curse is well deserved. David now is giving an explanation why this curse will fall on Judas and also on the nation of the Jews. Verse 16, the explanation because he, he refers to Judas, or refers to the nation of the Jews. Because he did not remember to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. So it is just, it is a just retribution for Judas' deliberate choice of evil, not showing mercy, there will be none to extend mercy to him. Because the Lord told us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If Judas or the Jews did not show mercy, then they deserve to obtain no mercy. If David meant King Saul as his enemy, definitely Saul was a persecutor of this kind. He never under any circumstances showed David mercy. But the description here barely seems to point to King Saul. Let us see the Jews. The Jews betrayed and murdered the afflicted Jesus, whose heart was broken with sorrow for their sins, as we read here, that they might even slay the broken in heart. Who was broken in his heart? Jesus. Jesus was broken in his heart for their sins, but they slayed him, they crucified him. The Jews did not show mercy to Christ when they struck him, nor did it move their compassion when Pilate brought him forth with a crown of swords on his head, 
saying, Behold the man and the intention of Pontius Pilate that the Jews, seeing the Lord with the crown of thorn, may have compassion on him. But in response, these merciless people, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And they gave him sour wine, mingled with gold to drink, and mocked him in all his agonies, when he said, I am thirsty. Also Judas did not show mercy, neither to the poor, because he stole the money of the poor, whom he cared not for, as St. John said in his Gospel, chapter 12, verse 6, he did not care for the poor, nor showed mercy to Christ, whom he betrayed with a kiss. The words of Christ, who called him friend, had no any effect upon him to move his heart with compassion when the Lord told him, friend, why have you come? Verse 17, as he loved cursing, so let it come to him. So why he is cursed? Because he loved cursing. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he loved to curse others, let him see what it is. Let it come upon him in its fullness. He has chosen this as his portion. Let it be his. As St. John Chrysostom says, after calling down many disasters upon Judas, the psalmist shows it was not from him, so not from David, but from Judas himself, whence came the source and origin of them. So why he was cursed, Judas was cursed, because Judas himself was the source and the origin of this cursing. And also rebelling as he did by his action, the grace from God. He pushed away the grace from God and bringing on himself affliction from God. So if this psalm is counted as one of cursing psalms, yet this cursing is not the hearty desire of the psalmist but it is rather a natural fruit of the corruption brought forth by the evil heart of the Jews or Judas. So we would not marvel to read about the wicked. As he loved cursing, so let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. Judas loved that which brought a curse about him. He loved the sin. Judas delighted not in the good will and good wishes of any to Christ. If anyone showed good will to Christ or good wishes to Christ, Judas did not like it. As appears from his dislike of the ointment being poured on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, by Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha. The Jews brought the curse on themselves and on their children when they said, His blood, blood of Jesus, be upon us and on our children, and which accordingly came upon them and remains to this day. Also, I'm sure you remember the Jews were displeased at the children when they said, Osanna in the highest, as we read in Matthew 21. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful thing that he, Jesus, did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Verse 18. As he clothed himself with cursing and with and as with his garment, 
So let it enter his body like water and like oil into his bones. Usually the moral qualities are often compared with clothing as it is written in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 be clothed with humility so humility here like a, a garment or in Job 29:14 i put on righteousness and it clothed me my justice like a robe and a turban in the same way the wicked's love for cursing became so much a part of him that David describes as if he wore cursing as his garment. As the virtue also can be a garment, cursing and vices can be garment. As he clothed himself with cursing as with his garment. So let it penetrate him through and through and let no part of him be unaffected by it. Cursing covers him like a cloak and should even penetrate to his bones and to his body. Why he said like oil into his bones, water into his body and oil into his bones. Oil is more piercing and penetrating than water. And if you rub your, your body with water, water will not penetrate as if or as you, you rub it with oil. So oil is more penetrating and piercing more than water. So oil signifies the inward and the quick sins he should have of his sins and of the wrath of God for them. So the punishment, he will feel it inwardly. St. John Chrysostom says, by this verse, David refers to the seriousness of the sorrow and to the perpetuity of punishment. This punishment is perpetual, never ending. Proclaiming that evil comes from them through their rejection of the good works. So because Judas and the Jews rejected good works, then evil and the cursing came and penetrated them through their own works and behavior. Verse 19, let it be the curse to him like the garment which covers him and for a belt with which he girds himself continually. The wicked man deliberately chose cursing and welcomed it to be a home in his heart, like a belt, like a garment. Has it chosen to put it on, to wear it, to appear in it? So let him constantly feel its consequences. He removed the blessings from his thoughts and purposes. So cursing became the habit of mind, which he assumed each day as naturally as his garment. So as we wear our garment every day, which he girds himself continually. So it was a positive refreshment and infiguration of his whole being. That's why let it stick and cling inseparably to him and let him never be able to free himself from it. St. John Chrysostom says, what he means is, evil holds fast to the wicked in such a way that it will be difficult for them to do any change. But on the contrary, it becomes so attached to them that it could not be detached. Of course, if they wanted to repent only through the grace of God, they can remove the evil and detach it only through the grace of God. Verse 20. Let this be 
the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my person. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accuser. This emphasizes that this is a prayer from David. Prayer, as he said in verse 4, I am a prayer. He would pray and leave the matter to the Lord. Lord's reward, let the gain or reward of the work be from God. God will decide. That's why what he uttered, it just was a prophecy, what God decided for Judas and for the nation of the Jews. This is what their conduct has earned and what they have received or assuredly will receive in the future. Uh, John, St. John Chrysostom says, David added that when he said, Let this be the Lord's reward to my accuser and to those, to those in general, who speak evil against my person. So David added those who speak evil to show that it is a punishment for evil, a reform for the evildoers, and that this verdict does not concern a particular evildoer, but concern all those who commit what we mentioned before. Verse 21, But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me. We learn that David did not rashly or unwisely utter curses against his enemies, but strictly adhered to what the Spirit uttered on his mouth. But David's trust was placed in God's alone. His prayer have been merely that justice might be done. And starting from verse 21, we can see a change or a transition from the mercilessness of man, the psalmist now is turning to implore the mercy of God. In verse 21, he turns to God in a prolonged prayer, nine verses, setting forth his needs before God and entreating for help deliverance, blessing, and triumph over his enemies. So after having betaken himself to God as his guardian and deliverer, he appears to take occasion from this circumstance to encourage himself in prayer. How? He said, But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me. Your name's sake implies that the motive which prompted David was a desire that God might be honored. So do this for your name's sake, that your name may be honored. Do this justice, that your name may be honored. Also, David is asking on the basis of God's name and mercy, not on the basis of his own righteousness or merit. He did not say, because I am good. He said, because your mercy is good. It was not mainly for his own pleasure, just to be relieved from the oppression. It was that God might be glorified, that the character of God might be revealed, that the plans of God might be accomplished. As St. John Chrysostom says, See his prudence, see his humility. Though having in his abused state sufficient grounds for an appeal, he can say, God, you can see how I'm abused, how I am suffering. But he nevertheless 
desist from saying this and has recourse only to God's loving kindness. It's because of your loving kindness, because of your mercy, because of your grace, not because I am worthy of it, not because I deserve it, but on your account, loving and merciful as you are. Verse 22, For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. David indeed was poor and needy when hunted upon the mountains by Saul and also when forced to flee from his son Absalom. The wound to David's heart was from the enmity of King Saul whom he served honestly and from his son who betrayed him. But this verse, I am poor and needy, also apply for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah described him as a man of sorrow. Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Nobody was wounded like Christ. For although he is righteous and the Holy One, he carried all our wounds. As we read in Zechariah 13 verse 6, he was wounded in the house of his friends. David's misery was also physical, as we read in verse 23. I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. You know, the shadow starts to broaden, then it disappears. So I'm saying I'm gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like a locust. David was frail and weak and needed the strength from on high. A shadow when it lengthens, when the sun is setting at the sunset and the shadow is going off, man's life is often compared to a shadow because fleeting momentarily and soon gone. As we read in 1 Chronicles 29:15. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Without hope, there is no hope to live eternally on earth. And so is the death of Christ. It may be rendered, I am made to go on the cross, I am made to go, indicating the violent death of Christ. As we read in Isaiah 53, 8, he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. What about a locust when he said, I am shaken off like a locust? Means unstable, continually escaping from place to place, and easily driven away with everyone. So David complains of his life being ever rendered uneasy, and constant persecution so that no space was allowed him for rest. He's like a Luke jumping from one place to another place. He is exposed to continuous changes and to much violence from his enemies. When you read in Samuel first and second Samuel, uh, the life of David, always, always, he was moving from one place to another place. But St. Augustine said the locusts here refer to the disciples of Jesus, his body members, who were like locusts. Why? Because during the time of crucifixion, they fled away and they disappeared like locusts. Verse 24, My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. A strength to stand in order to stand is connected with the firmness of the knee joints. That's why weakness and feebleness are denoted by the giving way of the knees. When the knees are weak, you cannot stand. That's why he said, 
my knees are weak through fasting. Through fasting, either voluntarily he fasted or forced it. He did not find when he was like a locust uh, moving from one place to place, he did not find food. So this verse is expressive of his sorrow and sadness. Also, this is a representation of the Lord Christ, who on the day he was tried, and after the mystical supper, he went to Gethsemane. He was arrested there. And all the night, he was actually in trials, six trials, six courts, three religious and three civil. So on, the, on that night, actually, they moved him from one court of judgment to another from one court to another, without food or drink, that he was so weak to carry his cross, and he fell underneath the cross. And by the word fatness, my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. Uh, some understand that he was deprived from all food which is pleasing to the palate. But it may indicate his becoming withered as a result of grief and sorrow and fasting in as much as the natural moisture was lost. Verse 25. I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. So instead of having mercy and compassion on the Lord Jesus Christ, which either religion or humanity should have taught them to exercise toward a person in extreme misery, but they reproached him instead. In all this, David was a type of Christ, who in his humiliation was thus wounded, thus weakened, thus reproached, and at whom they thus shook their heads, as we read in Matthew 27, they told him, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So they reproached him during the time of his misery. They looked at him and they shake their heads. He was also a type of the church which is often afflicted and the enemies of the church reproach the church. Then verse 26. Help me, O Lord, my God, Oh, save me according to your mercy. This is repetition of verse 1. So David repeats his prayer because the more we are attacked by the deceit of Satan, the more necessary it is, it is for us to strive more eagerly. His hope is that God will timely intervene for his relief and save him out of his troubles. It is not without reason that David, in order that he might withstand such attacks, places himself under the protection of God. Because God, according to his mercy, helps his people in the time of need. That's why he told him, save me according to your mercy. St. Augustine says the following words, according to your mercy, refer to the grace presented free, given to us free, and not according to the worthiness of our work. Verse 27, why he is asking for deliverance? That they may know that this is your hand, that you may be glorified that you, Lord, have done it. So it was very important to David that his enemies and all 
who looked on him knew that his rescue was from God's hand. The Lord had done it. He did not want a deliverance only for his own sake, no, but also for the glory of God. When they know it is the hand of God who rescued him. St. John Chrysostom says, what is the meaning of that this is your hand? That yours is the assistance. That yours is the help. He is saying, I want in fact not merely to be saved only, but also for them to know by whom I am saved so as to gain for myself double spoil. I am saved, your name is glorified. Double crowns, I am saved, your name is glorified through me. A heightened reputation. David understood that the curses of his enemies could never triumph over the blessing of God in his life. So if all the world had cursed us, but God blessed us, the blessing of God triumph over the cursing. That's why he said in verse 28, let them curse, I don't care. Let them curse. It doesn't bother me. But you bless. As long as you bless, I don't care about their cursing. Let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, let them be ashamed. But let your servant rejoice. Let your servant rejoice. So let them curse as Shammai, the son of Gira, cursed David. And he said, actually, let him curse me. When they attempt to put their wicked plans in action, in action like the conspiracy to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be ashamed. This would make David rejoice and his enemies be closed with shame wearing their disgrace as if it, it were a mantle. As we read in verse 29, let my accusers be clothed with shame and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. David having already presented his petition to God, and being secure in his favor seems, neither, seems now rather to boast that their cursing will do him no harm, nothing, as long as God is blessing him. By this he means, he proves how little and how lightly he regarded the threats of his enemies. Though they might attack him by the harm of tongue or by the power of the sword, but he doesn't care. And here David is a type of Christ. How a magnificent portrait of the event of the cross. How come? Let them be disappointed and so confounded as the Jews were, who, though they succeeded to bring Christ to the dust of death and grave, Yet to their confusion and to their shame, he arose again from the dead on the third day. They arose to crucify him, but once he resurrected, they were ashamed. They were closed with shame. They had closed themselves with cursing in verse 18, and now they are closed with shame. So the prayer now, that the covering of shame might be as complete and entire. But some fathers interpret, let them be closed, let my accuser be closed with shame, in order when they feel this shame, they may repent. As we read, some understood verse 29 as a petition of Christ that they might be brought to repentance for their sins, so to shame for them. So when they are ashamed, they repent. 
That's why the Lord prayed for the forgiveness of his enemies on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they were doing. St. John Chrysostom says, not once again, how he asks that they be given over not only to punishment, but to shame. So he's saying, now David is asking that they not to be punished, but to be brought to shame, to disgrace. Why? So that it may be for them a lesson in correction, if they wanted to learn from this lesson, and an occasion of a change for the better and repentance, if they want it. Verse 30. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. So in the middle of all these tribulations, he's praising God, as he called him in verse 1, God of my praise. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. So David anticipated the renewal of his thanksgiving and praises, as he said in verse 1, God of my praise. So the psalm started with addressing God as the God of my praise. And it ends with the confidence and the vow that he will continually praise God. He felt assured that his prayer is granted for he, God, shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. So he felt assured that his prayer is granted and that he will shortly triumph over his enemies. David's heart was to see God honored in this deliverance for your name's sake. Let them know that you have done it. He would praise God vocally and publicly among the multitude. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude. And vocally, I will praise him with my mouth. According to St. Augustine, it is the Lord Christ who talks here, who is present in the midst of the church, praising the Father in the name of the church. St. John Chrysostom says, in return for all these things, he makes recompense to God by way of thanksgiving and praise, announcing his achievements to everyone in open company among the multitude, turning herald announcer of the good things accorded him, that the good thing that God did for David. This, you see, is true sacrifice. This true offering, keeping God's favor constantly in mind, when we remember all the time God's favors to us, engraving them in our thinking, and preaching them by the word of mouth, and making many people hearers of his favor. So John Chrysostom saying, as David actually is preaching and is speaking about God's favor toward him, we should do the same. In this way, you see, the one who is beneficiary of his kindness, if you are beneficiary of God's kindness, will receive reward for gratitude, and as well, the listeners to favors done to others will be rendered more zealous. So when I am I'm giving thanks to God for all his kindness, I will receive reward for gratitude. And the listeners who listen to my praises uh, will be rendered more zealous. They will be more zealous in their spirit when they count the goodness presented to others. And this will be a chance to follow their lead in virtue. He shall stand at the right hand of the poor. Yes, God 
stand at the right hand of the needy as his advocate, his champion, while the accuser is to stand at the right hand, who is the accuser? Satan, the right hand of the wicked man. In verse 6, Let an accuser stand at his right hand. So see the difference. The wicked has Satan standing at his right hand. And the poor and humble having Christ standing at his right hand. God will always come to the assistance of the poor and needy. When unrighteous men oppress them. And will give them help and deliverance. God will give them help and deliverance. God was David's protector in his sufferings and was present also. God the Father was present with the Lord Jesus Christ in his suffering. Pilate and the Jews condemned our Lord to death. God showed his immaculate innocence, the immaculate innocence of Jesus Christ by his resurrection from the dead. So, To save him, God will save the poor from those who condemn him, like how Pilate condemned Jesus and the Jews condemned him. So the whole psalm is understood by many as referring solely to Christ, to the traitor Judas, and the wicked Jews. This concludes Psalm 109. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.